I V M. to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travellers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hi guys, welcome to a milestone episode of the Musafir Stories. This episode marks two years since the Musafir Stories was born. Happy birthday! Yay! <laughs> we just want to take a moment to um, thank you, our listeners, and uh, all of our guests for the tremendous support and love shown during this period. Faiza and I are just a couple of amateurs who started this podcast as a passion project, literally recording out of our bedroom. But you guys have supported us in spite and despite of our shortcomings. We both really, really appreciate your time and support. Well, also a big shout out to all our fellow podcasters, our hosting platform, most importantly, Audio Boom. Thank you so much. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, yeah, some our, of our um, podcasting apps. Yeah, such podcaster as... friendly apps, especially apps such as uh, Castbox, Storio and Hubhopper. Hubhopper. Who have literally um, given an extra push to all of the indie podcasters based in India. Right. And also a big kudos to all those individuals in the media who have put in an extra effort to bring out the stories of us Indian podcasters and the podcasting scene in India. Thank yep. you so much. Now, to mark this milestone episode, we couldn't have asked for a better person to come on the podcast and uh, share her travel story with us. She, who is an inspiration to an entire generation of travelers, it's none other than... Shivyanath! <laughs> yes, the shooting star, Shivyanath. So, to celebrate this momentous occasion and our second anniversary, we're giving away two copies of uh, Shivya's national bestseller and debut novel, The Shooting Star. So, listen to the episode first and uh, make sure to check out the contest on the show notes section of our podcast as well as on our social media handles and uh, send in your responses ASAP. So, with that, let's get on to this episode, right? Absolutely. Hi, Shivya. Hi. Hi, Seza. Hi, Seth. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I've been listening to your podcast for a while. And uh, it's really cool to be uh, one of the guests myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. We completely admire your work. And yeah, don't mention yes. it because I was uh, discussing this with Pfizer just before we started off. Um, uh, I was telling her that it's like uh, close to two years now since we've been doing this. And uh, I, I guess when we started out, if uh, somebody had told me that two years down the line, you'll still be doing this. And uh, two years down the line, you'll be uh, interviewing somebody like uh, Shivya Nath, who's literally at the top of a game in, in this sphere I would have uh, <laughs> laughed this away but uh, yeah today I guess we have to pinch ourselves in. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah I guess I guess we're all we're all in the same boat like seven years ago if someone had told me that someone would be saying that to me <laughs> I'd be like oh come on <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Shiv. yeah it's actually a milestone for the Musafir yeah, story definitely so. a milestone and uh, yeah. we're so glad and uh, that's why we decided that today um, we want to dedicate some time because uh, the, there's literally a generation of travelers and travel bloggers that look up to you now and, uh, and by saying no this I don't mean to <laughs> not just about the pressure but I'm uh, literally uh, making you uh, sound old by saying this but uh, it, it, I think it just speaks about uh, the kind of influence and the kind of impact you've had that uh, in such a short time um, the quality of work you've done it's literally inspired so many uh, it's, it's yeah. like uh, not just within the traveling and travel blogging circuit even when we run into some of our listeners uh, they ask us like have you uh, had a chance to like talk to Shivya Nath and uh, we used to tell them away by saying uh, no she's literally out of a <laughs> league right now so maybe in the future we'll do this but so those dreams have come true today, I guess, and um, thank you for uh, making this possible. That's why that's why um, we wanted to uh, literally dedicate this episode to kind of try and find out a little bit more about uh, this entire journey of yours, right? Uh, right. It's uh, surreal for uh, for a lot of us, and that's why we thought we'll uh, go behind the scenes a little bit and uh, find out a little bit more about uh, Shivya Nath, the shooting star, and obviously uh, now um, author of the national best-selling book as well by the same name, The Shooting Star. Uh, big, big congratulations on the book to Shivya and um, the enormous amount of success that it's received um, uh, kudos and hats off <laughs> to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thanks for such a flattering introduction. 
<laughs> it's, it's what am I pleasure, doing? Yes. Yeah, I think it's going to fall short. Um, so that's why we'll just jump into the interview and then find out more. And uh, that way, I think we can um, learn a lot more about how, uh, because this is to be painting this with a little bit of realism. This is not as rosy as it looks like. There's a lot of work, a lot of um, blood and sweat, as they say, that has gone in behind this. And uh, that's why we wanted to like talk to you a little bit more about the journey in itself and uh, find out more. Um, and Shibya, um, I just wanted to go back to the beginning and um, start from um, your childhood, right? Growing up, uh, like tell us and our listeners like where you grew, grew up and uh, how was childhood like? Did you always have ambitions of uh, like breaking free and doing something uh, radical or uh, how was it? Like some of us have crazy dreams while we're growing up and uh, while some of us just uh, look up to our parents or uh, somebody uh, close to us, like for a profession to follow, right? How was it with you? How was growing up? So I grew up in Dehradun. Most people in India would be mm-hmm. familiar with uh, with the place. It uh, sure. back when I was growing up, it was like a sleepy valley, uh, you know, just at the base of the mountains. And uh, I think my childhood was kind of a bubble. Many of us who grew up grew up in uh, small towns or small uh, small cities, small villages. You know, that kind of feels like the extent of our world. And I think uh, that's how it felt for me as well. Uh, so I guess my grandest ambition back then was maybe becoming a detective. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, of course, astronaut would be cool too. Right. Um, but, you know, we all scribbled those in like uh, in slam books and stuff, but never really thought that's what we'd become. And um, to be honest, I had no idea what I'd be when I'd, when I'd grow up. Uh, I definitely didn't think I'd be, you know, like this sort of rebellious person who's constantly trying to challenge everything that's uh, thrown her way. Uh, I definitely wasn't like that as far as I remember. My parents might think differently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it was a bit of a bubble growing up. And uh, I remember it as a pretty happy childhood, a very average childhood in that sense, you know, like just going to school and kind of always being uh, told to work better towards getting like better marks and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, I would say there was nothing unusual or extraordinary. And I didn't have any big dreams back then. Mm. If anyone had told me growing up that, you know, I'd be traveling around the world someday, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is. Um so yeah, it was pretty pretty average, uh, pretty fun, I'd say. Shivya ends up spending most of her childhood in Dehradun, growing up in a familiar environment with a cozy small town vibe. It wasn't until her 10th grade that the idea of moving away from home and family started to surface. And guess who was her inspiration for this? Well, to know that, listen on. So that journey was kind of paved by my brother, who, um, I mean, who's uh, who's really excelled in everything he's done. And uh, back when he was in the 10th standard, he got a scholarship to study in Singapore. Okay. And that kind of became my dream, like he was my idol and everything. I tried for that scholarship after 10th standard as well, but I didn't make it. But, you know, then I tried again after the 12th and I got like, uh, it was kind of like a semi-scholarship, semi-loan mm-hmm. uh, sort of situation. But I was pretty determined that I wanted to get out of India and study in Singapore. And uh, to be honest, I had only two options. Like my family was comfortable sending me to Singapore because my brother could look out for me. Right. Or um, they could send me to Delhi where I had like a plethora of relatives. I felt like if I went to Delhi, um, I mean, I, I didn't like worry so much about what the education would be like. But my main concern was that I would still be under the watchful eye of, you know, all the adults in my family and not be able to kind of grow up myself. Uh, so I think it was like that search for freedom, which made me feel like uh, if I have the opportunity to go out of India, I'm just going to take it and then see how it goes. So I actually ended up studying uh, something that I really shouldn't have. Uh-huh. Definitely didn't have the passion for it, didn't have the aptitude for it. But it was my ticket out of, uh, you know, India for a while. More more so, it was my ticket out of, um, you know, like a very protective upbringing and kind of doing things on my own after being uh, under like people's watchful eye for a while. Mm-hmm. So that's how I landed up in Singapore. And I think it did open me up to so much else in life. The year is 2005. In her search for freedom and the itch to explore her newfound adulthood, Shivya decides to grab the opportunity to study in Singapore without thinking twice. But was Singapore the promised land that Shivya thought it would be? Let's ask her to know what she thinks about it. I guess for a while it was because uh, it was for the first time that I was living on my own, living in a student hostel, but kind of making my day-to-day decisions on my own, uh, deciding my own curfew or no curfew (laughs) and uh, (laughs) uh, kind of just getting a sense of life that wasn't kind of uh, dominated by someone else. 
like just making my own decisions right. so that was definitely a high initially but after a while it kind of faded away because um, i mean sure i appreciated like the freedom aspect of it mm-hmm. but uh, like i said i was i was studying economics which made me pretty miserable because i like i've always leaned towards like the creative side of things more mm-hmm. and numbers just don't do it for me mm-hmm. but yeah it just felt like you know like i've signed up for this and i should just see it through mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how it was <laughs> yeah even now so um, you've been through um, your childhood and uh, teens in dehradun and now you're in singapore and i still don't see any hint of uh, travel or travel related <laughs> <laughs> yeah even in terms of um, a past time at this point right uh, when was it that uh, you started getting a calling if i may right and you've mentioned this also in the book uh, w- when was that sense of calling that you started to feel that uh, there is something away from all of this like other more um, materialistic if i may right uh, that's one way of putting it also things um, when, when when was that calling Sure so uh, I think while I was in college I did travel like a little bit with my friends but it was just uh, you know like the typical uh, getaway to kind of just get drunk and uh, <laughs> not really be aware of where you are but I think um, I started kind of getting a little bit more interested in in the world outside of my uh, of my student life and my work life was when I started working uh, and so just having like a little bit of disposable income meant that you know I could make kind of careless decision in terms of where I went So one trip that I remember pretty distinctly is uh, when uh, a friend and I were kind of fig- trying to figure out where we should go and we didn't really want to go to like a typical holiday destination so I literally zoomed into a map of um, of Indonesia mm-hmm. and um, started like zooming into like uh, you know like further and further uh, to finally find a place that you know like rang no bells with anybody uh, there was nothing written about it online and even now it's a pretty like virtually unknown kind of place and uh, we just made a decision to get there i remember it was a really long journey to get there so we took like a like a couple of buses and then we had to take this public ferry which was filled with chicken and people <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um and finally when we got to the island um, we found out that very bizarrely there's one man who's in charge of everything uh-huh. and everyone used to call him papa uh-huh. for some reason <laughs> so <laughs> so he kind of became our papa on the island as well and that's the first time we went snorkeling he didn't really communicate in our language and we didn't speak uh, you know his language mm-hmm. but just through uh, actions and just through like you know laughter and you know like the universal human language mm-hmm. we were uh, i remember sitting on like the top like his boat had a kind of a not really roof whatever you call it like right right i remember sitting on on top of that in the middle of um, like the water no one familiar i mean no one else in sight and nothing familiar around me and just feeling like you know this is the life and this as the sun set and you know it was like a beautiful feeling that's the first time i felt like you know there's something more to travel than what people typically know of it um yeah so i think that was like one of my earliest experiences that i remember following that uh, like i worked for a couple of years at the singapore tourism board and um, even though i liked my work uh, you know i wasn't uh, i mean I, i really enjoyed what i was doing which was in the social media space you know i had a good team i had to, i had good colleagues but um still there was this nagging feeling like am i going to do this for the rest of my life and at that point this is something i write about uh, you know in more detail in the book uh, at that point i had uh, i i won a contest online ironically something i came across as part of my work uh-huh. but uh, uh, i ended up winning a couple of tickets to europe mm-hmm. that just felt like you know the universe is giving me a sign and i have to take it right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah if I can if I can so, just interject yeah. at this point and uh, sure. <laughs> just get it to a little bit of specifics right it was a very intriguing um, question also that uh, won you that contest right uh, what would you do differently if life uh, if you had a second chance of life something on those lines right uh, i guess mm-hmm. uh, so what was your uh, response and uh, that won you this contest <laughs> so yeah so um so actually uh, i at that point you know whatever i wrote wasn't something that i really meant uh-huh. but uh, when i was writing like about this part of my life in the book mm. uh, i did go back uh, all those years to facebook and refer back to what my answer was uh-huh. and um, it was something along the lines of uh, don't we get a second chance at life every day mm. oh nice <laughs> that's wonderful so <laughs> yeah so it kind of so uh, i mean i think i wrote like uh, something around it mm. but uh, this was the gist of it okay mm. so wonderful yeah, and yeah. i think uh, it kind of just defined the, everything i did from there on as well so the year is 2011 by this time shivya had already been working with the singapore tourism board for 2 years it was around this time that a peculiar calling a yearning from within that she had experienced on her earlier trip to Indonesia resurfaced 
and ironically it was like life was giving her a second chance yeah so at the time when i won this contest uh, i really felt like you know this is uh, this is kind of like the universe telling me that this uh, this yearning that i'm feeling inside uh-huh. i have to kind of follow it and see where it leads me and um, it just so happened that we were having a restructuring at work so our, our team was getting shuffled and our roles were getting shuffled mm-hmm. and um, it felt like the right time to try and convince my bosses to grant me like a two month unpaid sabbatical from work which i was very lucky that they did so i decided to spend the first month of that uh, using that uh, you know using that flight ticket that i had won uh, so i went with a friend to europe and it was the first time uh, you know we were exploring the continent uh, the second month i decided to travel alone in india uh, to volunteer uh, in spiti uh, which is in himachal pradesh and uh, i think it was that aspect of uh, like my journey that uh, that really changed me because uh, it was for the first time that you know i really felt um, i mean even though i had come to singapore chasing that freedom uh, i think in, it was in spiti that i really felt it because it was the first time that i hiked alone i hitchhiked alone i was speaking with people who were so different from me and yet they didn't feel so different mm-hmm. right and uh, just uh, getting exposed to the ideas of sustainable tourism uh, of doing something that that actually makes a difference to someone else as well uh, but also feeds your own soul and i met some amazing people uh, throughout that trip and i think it made me realize that you know there's a whole world outside my cubicle and the paycheck that i'm earning and uh, that's when i decided to really question it mm. and mm. i think um, uh, i think it's a very apt moment for me also to uh, just point out that um, that feeling right that um, you came away with once you were um, in spiti or back from spiti uh, i just i just like to quote a couple of lines from your book shivya about this feeling right uh, you say that As I lay on that rooftop as I lay under a million stars I remember having this unshakable feeling that my life was about to change I can't explain it it was just like a calling so I think that's um, kind of beautifully captured yeah. the moment also uh, lying under a cold completely starlit sky and then uh, having this Strong beautiful feeling, feeling yeah. uh, which it's hard to explain to somebody right but you know within that there is the calling that that you have to go away and do something of your own something very different i'm with you all along this feeling i completely hear you out but how easy or how difficult was this conveying this or uh, getting this along to your family and to your parents how was their reaction so um so you know i guess uh, i guess we all have this feeling kind of buried inside us somewhere mm-hmm. but uh, sometimes you just need to create like the space and the silence to actually hear it and feel it and act on it mm-hmm. when i when i felt that feeling i i decided that i have to act on it and it doesn't matter what people around me think mm-hmm. even though i had this idea brewing in my head that you know i'm not going to continue with with this you know 9 to 5 job i'm going to try something else in life I pretty much had this you know this thought in my head or this plan in my head but I didn't reveal it to people for the longest time not until I actually uh, sent in my resignation letter actually much much after that as well mm-hmm. but the way I broke it to my family was a bit different than trying to explain the feeling because I didn't think they would connect with it as much <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at that point I was kind of working with impartial information uh, at that point I just told them that you know I'm kind of um, I'm kind of done with this you know like this job for a while uh my dream is to move back to india and maybe work in the in the social sector maybe work with like a non-profit organization or a social enterprise try something different and um, they weren't very sold on the idea but i had already put in my resignation letter so they there wasn't much they could do <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, because um I feel personally that uh, that's one of the challenges that we um come across right trying to explain our decisions to our uh, closed ones yeah. uh, especially the family and then uh, because they have a completely different viewpoint of life right because they have uh, grown up under completely different circumstances and uh, uh, to be fair they're uh, very different people also like each one is a very different individual <laughs> so that that's why it's yeah. uh, <laughs> Yeah I think uh, I think that's absolutely true and uh, I mean I know that that's that's something that holds back so many people from trying to follow their passion or trying to follow their dream. Mm, sure. Uh I mean I completely understand like you know because they are different people or because they've grown up under different circumstances they have different dreams for us but I think at the same time you know we only have one life and if we're going to stifle our dreams because of someone ex- else's expectations then i mean then we're just going to pass that on to future generations you know because um like what we see in today's world is that a lot of parents are trying to live their own dreams through their children and then presumably their children when they become parents will try to do the same through their children 
and then we get stuck in this vicious cycle and i think our generation just has to break that cycle you know with all due respect uh, like we have to i mean at the end of the day we have to bring our own happiness into the equation because um like in india a lot of parents kind of try to equate monetary success or like climbing the corporate ladder with happiness mm-hmm. and when we when we kind of break that equation and put other things other components into it then i think we can help them understand that you know we need to live a good life but at the same time we need to find that sense of fulfillment or that sense of happiness as well absolutely it's so, um, brilliantly put and um yeah one of the difficult challenges but i'm uh, glad that you got over that phase and uh, we 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 are all glad that you're doing what you're doing and uh, i i just want to like <clears throat> circle back a little bit to your blog right um, at, at this point were you blogging on and off or uh, when was the birth of the shooting star shivya your uh, very popular and very famous blog that you pen <laughs> uh, so actually i had like a handful of blogs before i started the shooting star mm-hmm. uh, simply because i was um, i was always interested in writing like a little bit uh, but all the blogs i had before the shooting star were like life rant blogs mm-hmm. so uh, i just wanted to rant about life and you know like your friends don't always want to hear you rant the internet is a good space to do that <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, that was my foray into blogging. Uh, the shooting star kind of started that way as well, but um, I really liked the name. Like it always, um, I mean, it always held a special meaning for me, especially after Spiti. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So uh, it's it's the name that I stuck around with, and uh, uh, I gradually kind of revamped the blog to be to have much more of a travel focus than of you know like just general life related posts. Mm-hmm. And this was back in, um, I mean, I kind of revamped it back in 2011 uh, at about the same time that I started, that I went on that unpaid sabbatical from work. Right, right. Mm-hmm. At this point, I guess you've moved back to India, right? And um, you're dabbling with uh, a little bit of um, travel, travel writing and uh, other social work also that you wanted to get involved in through travel. W- w- what was on your mind and what was your, say, uh, near to medium term plan, Shivya, at this point? Uh, so actually when i left singapore uh, i had um, i had come across a, a rather obscure fellowship in india mm. which promised to give the opportunity to uh, sort of uh, travel to remote places in the country and uh, do projects uh, related to these places uh, so that was the that was what i'd sold to my parents that you know this is this sounds like a great opportunity for me and exactly what i want to do but when i actually got to india and i uh, you know like i showed up for uh, the so called fellowship uh i realized that it was i mean maybe more meant more for like people who were in college or just starting out uh not someone who had uh, who had finished college who had worked for a couple of years and who had like pretty grand ideas if i might put it that way mm. <laughs> um <laughs> so uh, so basically i realized that this this fellowship thing is not meant for me but i still wanted to work uh, you know like uh, like travel was on my mind writing was on my mind and working you know maybe with a social enterprise was on my mind as well but i was pretty open to how things would take shape and um, gradually what happened is uh, i picked up different projects uh, in different spheres but the thing that stuck around was the writing aspect of it and the thing that drove the writing was the traveling so ultimately uh, i focused i began focusing a lot more on writing for different publications as well as writing for my own blog now back in india shivya tried her hand at writing travel and working with social enterprises it was during these experiments that shivya had her first encounter with entrepreneurship in 2012 what was the driving force behind this and how did shivya leverage her previous experiences to make this work we'll find out uh so that also happened uh, you know like it was also driven by traveling and writing and uh, the idea was actually born in punjab where uh, uh, i was uh, i was at a farm and this farm that didn't have like a mention on uh, google until page 6 <laughs> and that to one on an obscure website which said you know there's such a farm stay but the experience was absolutely amazing and uh, it actually uh, really helped me connect back with my roots in india mm-hmm. and um, while i was there i felt like you know there's uh, there's this huge gap in the indian market uh, this is back in 2012 that there's this big gap in the indian market you know there are these um, amazing experiences scattered across the country but a lot of these uh, a lot of the people who host these experiences don't even have access to the internet and definitely don't know much about social media and here i am uh, who's really interested in these experiences and i have these social media skills that i developed at my uh, previous job so i could use my skills to kind of bridge this this digital marketing gap mm-hmm. and um, that's exactly how india on travel was born After having found a way to marry travel and work, 
through India and travel, Shivya had found her elixir. Travel that is purposeful, mindful of the environment and inclusive of the local communities. Through this venture, she discovered the nooks and corners of real India and over the next three years, gradually turned India and travel into one of India's top 20 travel startups. But like with most startups, the pressure of scale and revenue started to follow and Shivya felt that the numbers and the competition began to erode away the joy of travel. This is when she decided to bite the bullet and sell India Untraveled. It was one of the hardest decisions that she had to make. Yeah, I think it was an extremely hard decision and uh, one I sat on for a really long time, mm. much longer than I probably should have. But um, ultimately, like when, when we decided that it was time to let it go, uh, I mean, I felt like even though I was letting go of India and Travel as a company and as a brand, mm. uh, I felt like I'd still be doing the same things with my blog, with a lot more freedom to do it. So in a way, I convinced myself that it's not as heartbreaking. <laughs> 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 so India Untraveled still does exist today, right? As as a brand, as a it company, does. Mm-hmm. it does. Yeah, wonderful. And um, Shivya, at this point, were your um, energies and your focus uh, completely on the blog, or were you still dabbling with a couple of different things? At this point, I was still dabbling with a couple of different things. So there was blogging, uh, there was India Untraveled, which was let go. Uh, there was freelance writing, and then there was other freelance stuff. At this point, I did feel like, uh, you know, like the blogging landscape is changing. And in the coming years, there's going to be a lot more potential than there is now. And so I wanted to focus a lot more of my attention on the blog, mm. as well as on my travels. Right. That's kind of when, um, you know, I became a lot more serious about about blogging and uh, the kind of content I was creating. Mm-hmm. And Chibya, at what point did you take the decision that you're going to go ahead and uh, leave your home and sell out most of your possessions and take traveling as your life? Yeah, because uh, yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> tricky, right? Uh, even even a lot of um, the people I know who travel full time or close to full time, they still have their route is somewhere, right? They call some places base, uh, but you completely have uh, even shattered that stereotype, <laughs> and uh, you've literally given up your home and uh, just a girl with a backpack. <laughs> so, uh, when did when did that happen, and um, uh, what went into that decision of yours? So I guess that happened a couple of years after I quit my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I was still living in Delhi. And I think Delhi has a huge role to play with kind of pushing me out and not just out of the city, but out of my comfort zone. (laughs) I guess Delhi has that effect on people. (laughs) But um, I think it was just the realization that, uh, you know, like, of course, I can have a place and I can earn a bit more money and pay rent here. But what's the point? You know, like we, um, like if you just look at like the things we own, like our cupboards and our shelves and stuff, most of the things we don't really need in our everyday life. And uh, when that realization struck struck me, it kind of just felt like a burden. You know, I have this place and this is my home and I have these possessions and these are my things and I have to keep them safely. So I think it kind of just started feeling like uh, it's a burden on me that I don't really need. And so uh, it, it just began as kind of an experiment. Uh, so the place that I was renting in Delhi, I just stopped renting it. I moved out of it, I sold most of what I owned either on eBay or just to friends or uh, gave it away to someone who needed it. And um, it was actually really liberating. And I felt like, you know, if at some point I feel that, you know, I still need a base, I can always find another one. Uh, so there was no pressure in terms of, you know, like this is my life now and this is how I have to live. But um, just an experiment to see if I enjoy living this way. And uh, if I do, then I'm going to continue it. And if I don't, then, you know, I can always decide to change. I mean, uh, you, you, you're uh, literally <laughs> sounding like one of the hermits, right? The Satos who are uh, literally <laughs> cut off from uh, worldly belongings. And uh, you're like, uh, we, we, we don't need much. So wherever we go, we'll, if we need a base, we'll make that a base. So <laughs> you sound like... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm more like a digital like moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Instagram is like my base. <laughs> yeah, that's the only place people can always find you at, right? Um, not a physical location, but uh, the internet, perhaps. I think this is um, great. I mean, uh, this is one of the uh, traditional stereotypes that you've already broken, broken yeah. yeah, broken and broken away from, right? Uh, that you need a place, you need a base, a route. And I think the biggest factor is being a girl. Taking that decision is a very, very big thing to do. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we don't want to sound uh, uh, very stereotypical and uh, no, but then, oh, I mean, you are being the a girl. woman, I yeah. can understand that. <laughs> I guess your father can at least say yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> because every decision you take take is scrutinized by a lot of people, and the very factor that you are a girl and you're not supposed to do certain thing always comes into picture. So yeah, hats off to you. It's like an inspiration. altogether yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, so i feel like um, i mean like you know this is something that people ask me all the time uh-huh. uh, but i think like even as women we, we tend to like over complicate things in our head that's true and i have this <laughs> <laughs> i have this theory now that like you know like sometimes we just need to be solely aloof to be able to make the decisions we want to make okay. and at that point we just have to say that you know like people might judge me for doing this but i don't care because you know this is this is my calling or this is something that i really want to do yeah. and you know like 30 years from now their judgment is not going to matter but my decisions are going to matter absolutely that that is so true <laughs> yeah i think, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a great line also and uh, um also shivya just adding more to this right the but you breaking away from um, traditional stereotypes uh, um see one thing was as i said um, you've already broken away from the stereotype that you, one needs a base and even just looking at uh, the way in which you travel right for a lot of people we even personally speaking like me and faiza we see it something close to heart something we're passionate about but um, you've gone that extra mile and almost made travel into a lifestyle right uh, i think that also speaks volumes about um, the way you look at travel and uh, perceive travel as well right it's literally your lifestyle right now and uh, some of the choices you've made as well uh, things like adopting veganism that has um, come up from your personal experiences and uh, how have you uh, managed that uh, with your travel lifestyle uh, do you want to give a little bit of an insight into that as well Yeah sure so it's been about 3 uh, years now since I turned vegan mm. and um, for people who are not familiar with the term it basically means that uh, I don't I don't consume any animal products as far as possible so that includes everything from meat seafood eggs milk products um, honey eggs uh, and even lifestyle products like silk and leather and bees wax and things that come from animals and um, i mean there was uh, there was one incident that kind of triggered it but ultimately uh, what led to it was uh, you know just just like awareness uh, so i guess so many of us uh, don't really consider where the food on our plate is coming from but the moment we kind of uh, start thinking about it and kind of building our awareness around it uh, i think there's no way to escape um, being becoming aware of the animal cruelty that it involves right. so uh, something as simple as the cheese on our toast in the morning uh just the process by which uh it gets to us not just not just in factory farming uh, but also you know like on so called organic or free range or ethical farms so i guess uh, for me it was um it's been it's been a journey in that sense you know just learning about things that i've been consuming but haven't really known this their source and something that's not really told to us growing up or something that's not very visible to us unless we really open our eyes and look Uh, I guess that was my foray into veganism. Like it started with the internet and with some friends who had also taken that decision. Uh, but ultimately, in past three years, I've also tried to live on some um, like free range organic farms, uh, both in India and other parts of the world. And um, I just couldn't convince myself that uh, you know that there is no animal cruelty involved because there is. So at that point, uh, so about three years ago, when I decided that you know I'm going to turn vegan and kind of have this uh, a bit more restrictive diet. I didn't really know if I could continue with a nomadic life because um because I'm pretty much reliant on other people to sort of provide my food. I rarely have access to a kitchen. But uh, yeah, over the over the past few years I've realized that actually a lot of the traditional diets in the world have been vegan, which has been a very interesting realization. Um I've also kind of uh, a lot of people ask me if I'm missing out on the local culture by not uh, trying out a lot of the, you know, like what is the local cuisine. but um i've actually discovered that uh, you know by by being able to convey to people you know that i'm vegan why i'm vegan uh, how we can how i can kind of customize uh, the food that they can offer i've actually realized that a lot of people have been uh, not only open to it but uh, i've made so many friends through the process because you're making such a great like you're making a greater effort uh in terms of finding you know like food that suits you mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of people if uh, spoken to in the right way you know i try to learn in their language to explain you know what i can eat what i can't eat and why uh, and i think that immediately opens up um, you know like space for conversation and just kind of understanding where each of us are coming from and i think that's been really powerful on my travels when i was going to japan uh, which was earlier this year 
uh, I was going to spend a month in Japan and uh, I didn't want to just go to uh, Japan and Kyoto where everyone goes. Uh, I wanted to go to like the countryside and really small villages and kind of really experience uh, like Japanese culture as well as go to some places which are pretty remote and have some amazing natural beauty. And um, of course, I'm vegan, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and people say that it's impossible to even be vegetarian in Japan. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in fact, like uh, I posted on a uh, on a like a foodies group in Japan uh, on Facebook, mm. and I said that you know like this is my plan. I plan to go to the countryside and so forth. And do you think I'll be able to manage some vegan food? Um, so someone wrote, "This is mission freaking impossible." <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> Uh, so I thought, okay, like uh, let me let me take on this mission impossible and see what happens. And uh, I went prepared with some, you know, like emergency energy bars and stuff like that in case I really don't find anything. But I actually ended up having some of the best food of my life in that one month in Japan, in really remote villages, in the countryside, in really small towns. And um, uh, I think there were some simple uh, things that I did. So first of all, um, uh, like the first Japanese friend I made. Uh, helped me write down in very in a lot of detail what it is that I can eat, uh, what it is that I can't eat, and why. And you know, like Japanese are very polite people, so you know, like it was written in a very polite way, and I think that really helped. Uh, I think the second thing was uh, people in general are really friendly, uh, really helpful, and they really want to do something to help you out. So every time I went to a restaurant and you know showed my little script to people, saying that. Uh, this is what I can eat, and this is what I can't eat. Uh, they would get really baffled at first and really worried, but then they would talk amongst each other and then figure out something that I could eat. And that something turned out to be like an elaborate uh, meal with a lot of different dishes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, they actually put like a lot of uh, this, um, like this thing called dashi, which is kind of a fish broth mm-hmm. uh, that they put into a lot of dishes. And it's basically just making a lot of food without it, and then it's it just happens to be vegan. Mm-hmm. So that's something I learned along the way. Right. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. I think it's also that perception, right? That people tend to think that it might be really hard to um, like find vegan food on your travels and stuff like that. But it's not that. And um, also a little bit about awareness also, right? A lot of uh, don't even know about this. And I think you're already doing a great job in uh, spreading the word about um, veganism that way. So that's wonderful. And uh, it's a great uh, way of um, learning a little bit more about your um, uh, lifestyle as well as to how you've uh, literally make, made this an int- integral part of your lifestyle uh, by combining uh, travel with so many different uh, things and uh, veganism is just one of them. Um, but um, one one sticking question that we had, Shivya, was... Uh, Shivya, you, uh, maybe I can ask Shivya. Yeah. Shivya, this entire transition of, I mean, not a transition, but your decision to go ahead and write a book and uh, engage a, l- a larger audience and to give us a peek about into how your world has been, what was it? I mean, why did you go ahead and write a book? What was the decision? Yeah, but when was that uh, like spark set off? It is close, but it's not exactly the same thing as blogging, right? It's right. a whole new yeah. animal, uh, writing a book. So when did that happen, Shivya? At some point, maybe maybe three or three and a half years ago, I felt like it was time, you know, I had like uh, a huge range of experiences that I wanted to share. Mm-hmm. But more than that, I kind of wanted to introspect about my own journey as well as... Uh, ask a lot of people, you know, some difficult questions which we don't tend to ask, uh, you know, uh, basically just about challenging conventions because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of us just kind of accept what um, what people tell us or what life throws our way and we don't try to challenge that. And I think uh, that was that was the inspiration behind um, getting to writing a book. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did start like about uh, maybe two and a half, three years ago, mm-hmm. but I, I trashed a lot of what I wrote earlier. But I think my main inspiration came when I turned 29 because um, I felt like I want to finish this book before I turn 30. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was like a self-imposed deadline uh, about how the journey has been. In one word, uh, it's a lonely journey. The whole process of writing a book is pretty lonely, especially if you're a blogger, because, uh, you know, we're so used to instant gratification. Like we think of a story idea, we write it, it's out there, people are reading it, sharing it, commenting on it, and then we move on to the next thing. Uh, But with the blog, uh, with the book, it was like uh, for one and a half years, I was working on it, editing it, pitching it, reviewing it, editing it uh, without knowing if it's actually ever going to be published, if people are actually going to buy it and read it. So in that sense, it was it was a pretty, um, you know, lonely journey. And um, you just had to kind of stay motivated because, you know, you just felt like you have to do it. There's no other option. Mm. 
Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, for um, all the listeners out there, um, I would I would definitely urge you to go check out Shivya's um, book, which is also named after a blog, uh, which is The Shooting Star. And it's available everywhere, um, Amazon, Flipkart. And uh, it's, I guess it's available everywhere, basically. I urge you to go check it out. It'll give you a completely new perspective um, into how one girl, her backpack and the world. <laughs> that's that's the uh, tagline of the book too. I think it's a great way of um, getting a deeper uh, insight into the way Shivya travels and travel in traveling in general as to how it's been intrinsic to, to mankind. Like since the beginning of time, it's not something that uh, uh, we millennials have picked up, right Shivya? <laughs> I think that's the <laughs> bigger message of the book. That's what I feel. Um, and uh, as, as we start uh, inching up towards the end of this um, interview, right, Shivya, a couple of questions I had was, um, I mean, see, so you, you're doing this full time. You're doing this um, very differently. You've broken away from conventions and uh, obviously you've had like um, a variety of challenges that you've faced through, you've persevered through. But for somebody even looking at it um, now, right, um, as an option, as something they're passionate about, um, but might be having, uh, say, second thoughts just because of um, societal pressure and things like that. What would you say to them? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I'd say is, you know, you just have to do it. But um, there's so much online wisdom that, you know, like you just quit your job and, you know, go traveling or quit your job and follow your passion or whatever. But I think it's really important to be practical about it if you want it to be sustainable, uh, especially financially. And so um, I think it's really important to come up with uh, at least a basic plan of how you hope things will pan out and still give it some space to evolve. But at the end of the day, I think don't let anyone tell you that your dreams are impossible or impractical because, um, you know, you might prove them wrong a few years down the line. Absolutely. I think that's some great advice. And uh, Shivya's blog in itself has some great resources as to how one should uh, plan financially and um, plan ahead, right? Um, and not just make uh, decisions at the drop of the hat. These are informed decisions you've made. It's not something, obviously, there has been that calling and uh, you followed that calling, but um, you back that up with some informed decisions as well as to how you would sustain yourself um, through that journey. And that's that's how this journey has become so beautiful. And uh, we're glad that you've shared this with uh, so many more of us, Shibya. And um, we'd like to thank you for that. And uh, through your blog, through your um, book, which is a national bestseller, as I said, you've shared this joy, you've shared this journey, and um, it gives all of us not just travel goals, goals, yeah, yeah. More, li more like life goals, I think. So it's it's been uh, brilliant talking to you all this uh, all this while. Uh, and uh, before we let you go, if I just had to ask you, if life were to give you <laughs> another chance at things, uh, would you have done things differently? Mm, maybe I would have dropped out of college. <laughs> 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 maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just a rhetorical question but all of your experiences right um, all of the different experiences that you wish you had or wish you didn't have all of them I'm sure have added up towards um, your perspective of life how you look at it and how um, you've made the decisions uh, so I'm, I'm sure they have uh, value to add but um, obviously it's some great advice uh, that you've given out in your book as well as to how to sustain uh, this li lifestyle that um, chooses travel over things that are materialistic and things that are more rooted so uh, thank you so much Shivya it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful time that uh, both Faisal and I have had and I hope our listeners to enjoy this and uh, for someone uh, looking to keep up with your work obviously we'll share all the links in the social media handles, etc. Uh, but any final ma message to our listeners, Shivya? So first of all, thank you so much for <laughs> another flattering conclusion. But uh, it was really, it was really fun talking to you guys and, you know, kind of going through my whole journey again. Yeah, I guess my message for, uh, for anyone listening is, um, you know, of course, I would uh, encourage everyone to travel because it's such a great uh, way to learn about the real world. But at the same time, uh, I think it's so important to be mindful of how we travel, uh, you know, uh, to consider how how our travels impact the people who live in these places and the environment in general. It's, it's really important to think about our footprint, to cut down our single-use plastic, to be aware of whether some traditions really support the community or are based in, in archaic, you know, traditions which, which we don't believe. Uh, so I think it's really important to be conscious of uh, where we travel and how we travel. And um, have a good time. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Shubhya. I mean, it's uh, really hats off to you. At such a young age, you have made s- such a huge impact, and along with your travel, you have beautiful messages that you give and create such a positive impact on all of us, from veganism to making sure that the nature and our environment is protected. Thank you so much, and especially th- a big thank you for being on the Musafir Stories. It is indeed a real inspiration to all of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Shubhya. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. That was yet another great episode of the Musafir Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Audio Boom, Savan, Pocket Casts. Castbox, Stitcher, or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android. Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories. Or if it suits you, you could email us at themusafirstories at gmail dot com or visit our website at www dot themusafirstories dot com. For more information, all of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing, and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye.